So good evening, everybody, and welcome to Cool Petaluma's Ask an Expert series. Big thanks to Annie Stewart, who's made, uh, made this possible by coordinating the speakers. Uh, Annie has programmed this series out to the end of the summer, so every Wednesday, 6 p.m., so do please make sure that all your block members and friends and relatives know about this great, great series. Um, I'll be introducing our speaker in a few moments, but before I do, please mute yourself. Uh, we are recording and we don't want any unintended background noises. Um, our speaker will be presenting for about 15 minutes, after which uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. So as, as uh, uh, questions come up, uh, just put them in the chat. Uh, also, as a reminder to yourself, and um, uh, then we also have a, uh, a, a, a documentation of the kind of questions. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Rick Brown, uh, who is going to be talking about his journey to, and he have in parentheses, almost all electric home. Uh, he's going to be talking about clean, uh, clean energy options for home and business, do's and don'ts, and uh, time permitting, when's the right time to go EV? So welcome, Rick. And uh, with that, maybe you give a fuller introduction about yourself. Very good. I'm going to put a, uh, a slideshow up here just to kind of help me with my notes. So just uh, have the screen share here. So I'm going to does everybody see my screen. Yep. It says my, my story. Yeah. So just to give you some context, um, most of my career was as a, a community organizer and organizational strategy consultant. And in 2005, I was engaged by the National uh, Environmental Litigation Organization, Earth Justice, you know, the, the organization that says every planet needs a good lawyer, uh, to help them develop their climate strategy. They were organized around a bunch of individual issues, but they didn't have a comprehensive climate strategy. And through that experience, I really got focused around, I need to have the rest of my career uh, focus on those issues. And in parallel, I was working with a company that was one of the leaders in financing low-income housing through something called the Low-Income Housing Tax Credit, and was able to convince them that this solar thing was going to be a big deal. And so when the federal government passed the law that established the investment tax credit for solar, it seemed like a, a good opportunity for them to get into the solar financing business. They were one of the first, if not the first, to get into syndicating uh, financing for solar through the investment tax credit. The deal was, though, I had to leave my consulting practice to help them start up that business. So I left my consulting practice, uh, started that business, MMA Renewable Ventures, uh, ended up selling that company three years later and um, decided to not go with the company that bought that company and started up a company called Terra Verde uh, Renewable Partners, eventually Terra Verde Energy, which uh, I stayed with until I retired in uh, January of 2020. And that company uh, business was to help schools, cities, water agencies, transit agencies, all kinds of public agencies figure out if and how to implement solar and eventually solar plus storage, including some building electrification things. Um, more recently, we are working with a number of community choice aggregators like Sonoma Clean Power, which we have here in Sonoma County, but we're working with ones around the state to help them develop customer programs to put help customers get into solar and storage in a way that not only helps the customer, but also helps the overall rate payers of that community choice agency. So that gives a little bit of context and background. Can I have one of those lattes? I, I hear a latte being made in the background there. Somebody want to mute their, mute their sound? Okay, so um, that's the background professionally. I, just to be clear, my experience professionally has been more in the what's called the non-residential commercial and utility scale side of clean energy and building electrification versus the residential side of things. Um, so just to kind of get us into the notion, you know, um, I think we're all aware, but if not, um, the reports recently from the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, how important it is that we really do focus on change the way we live. Um, that you know we really only have a few years to turn things around to avoid the most uh, difficult and in some cases, 
very somewhat disastrous potential outcomes. And so this is why um, I got into the clean energy world um, a number, you know, close to 20 years ago and why I, I'm so excited about Cool Petaluma as a grassroots approach to that. Um, and the other thing that, um, you know, one of the things that happens when you come to, to terms with the enormity of the challenge is that it can be very daunting and in some ways discouraging. But um, James, this quote from James Baldwin is one that um, I, I kind of keep in front of me. Um, nothing, not, the, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So I'm gonna go into my story and uh, you know, I'm just gonna cover the main areas. And again, glad to, to entertain questions uh, at the end, but I'll just sort of run through how I have in my personal life tried to make things happen to you know, come to terms with this realization that I had around the enormity of the climate change issue. So in the transportation side, I, I, I didn't put in the, my, my Prius. I, I was told by the Toyota dealer that I had bought the 40th Prius back in uh, 2002 or so, but finally gave up the ghost of my Prius after 250,000 miles, uh, donated it to a local homeless shelter when the Chevy Volt came out, which is a hybrid electric car and, and got a lease on that car because I was hopeful that a full EV would be available that could work for me in terms of my driving habits. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, the, the leaf came out in 2014 and my wife got one of those leafs, but it didn't have enough range for the kind of work I was doing, driving up and down California, uh, helping schools and others get into solar. So I had a second lease on a Volt in 2016. In 2013, I also was able to get a level two charger. This is the fast charger. It's not the fastest charger, but a, a charger that would allow me to charge my car fully overnight uh, at my home. And it was free in the sense that the California Energy Commission paid for the charger. I just had to pay an electrician about 250 bucks to do the electrical work to, to put it in. Uh, then finally, when the bolt came out, my wife replaced her leaf with the bolt. And then in 2018, I replaced my Volt uh, with a Tesla Model 3. Uh, one of the things that people need to understand about electric vehicles, and maybe many of you know this already, but MIT came out with a study looking at the life cycle cost of owning any car that was made in the United States. This was back in 2018, 2019. They've updated it recently. And they basically found that from a life cycle cost standpoint, meaning total capital cost, total maintenance, total fuel cost over a 10 year period, uh, the Bolt and the Tesla Model 3 were the cheapest cars to buy. So if you can figure out a way to finance it at the front end over that 10 year period, it's gonna be the cheapest car you can have, bar none. Um, and I can get into why that is, but you know, one of the main reasons is my fuel costs are extremely low. They're about one third what they would be if I got gas, bought gas on my Prius, for example. Um, and there's literally no maintenance costs. I've had the Tesla for four years. Uh, I've replaced the tires once because I have, you know, at 40,000 miles and I had to fix a crack in the glass. My insurance paid for most of that. That was 250 bucks. And there were some steering arms that I had to replace after 50,000 miles. So I spent about $800 over four years. I, I can't imagine that there's any internal combustion engine car that anybody has that that has that kind of situation. And then in 2018, got a second level two charger from Sonoma Clean Power. Again, free, except that I had to have some electrical upgrade work. So that's been my journey around electrification of my transportation. And uh, because um, I have, and I'll explain, I put in solar in 2010, uh, paid back my overall cost within seven years and now and cash flow positive on that project. On, on that project. Now that was because I was able, you know, as an early adopter, to get what are called the California Solar uh, uh, Initiative incentives, which no longer exist, that paid for part of the project. And I'm grandfathered under a rule known as net metering 1.0, which determines the value of any power that I put onto the grid when my usage is less than what I'm generating. Now we're under an NEM 2.0 regime, which has less value for that exported power. 
And we're very soon gonna go into net metering 3.0, which is gonna be even less. So if you're thinking of doing solar, you really want to get going in the next three to five months because this net metering 3.0 will reduce the value of that solar much more. Um, and there's all what your payback might be, what your cash flow might be around that varies widely depending on your usage, what your orientation is, your home in terms of the efficiency and effectiveness of your panels. But if you can't do that, a very easy way to be 100% clean energy is to subscribe to Sonoma Clean Power's Evergreen. Uh, where you get 100% clean power, and it's only about 5% more annually than if you were getting PG&E's dirtiest power, uh, and and even a few percent less, uh, you know, more than uh, Sonoma Clean Power's standard power. So you can get clean energy, get an EV, you have clean transportation completely, you have clean power at your home completely, and that's why. We, we need to electrify everything because we have the option of having clean energy, uh, of having clean usage of our entire home if we in Sonoma County because we have this evergreen option and of course the solar option. Um, I and you know fast forward uh, in 2021 last year I replaced the water heater in my home, a gas water heater because it gotten to the end of its what's called its economic useful life. Uh, it was, you know, starting to not be as efficient. It was about 10 years old. Uh, and um, so I replaced that one. And I also have an ADU where I replaced the water heater there. Uh, I had to do some electrical upgrade to make that work. Uh, but I got incentives from Sonoma Clean Power and what's called Bayren, although you do this, the application through Sonoma Clean Power that uh, paid for about 30% of the the two uh, hot water heaters. If I'd just done the one water heater, would have paid for about 50%. And I get $5 a month because the water heater is hooked up to the grid such that Sonoma Clean Power can adjust when my hot water heater operates to help it manage its requirements around usage uh, as a, as a uh, retail provider of power in California. Again, I can explain all that if you're interested. Um, in terms of cooking, I did replace a gas stove in my ADU with an electric stove, uh, and that involved some upgrade. And I, the upgrade that I did also will allow me to install a heat pump, uh, a, a space heater, basically heating device in the ADU when the time is right. And for me, that time is right will be when there are incentives that are coming down the pike from the California Public Utilities Commission for those kind of heaters in the next year or two. Uh, and I will do the same with my uh, my home heating, uh, as I mentioned below, and with my gas range to an induction electric range. Right now, still have a gas range. Uh, one thing that uh, one reason I'm really anxious to uh, change that induction uh, to induction electric is because in order to get the incentive for my gas water heater, I had to so have somebody come to my home and inspect my stove and my uh, furnace. Uh, in terms of um, emissions, right? Uh, pollutants that come from the device. And the thing that was kind of scary, and I have, I have a very high end gas range that is um, supposedly very efficient. Uh, when the guy tested uh, the device, the stove, when it was off, meaning the stove was turned off, he tested it both right at the stove and 15 feet away in my kitchen family room, he found uh, NOx, nitrogen oxide levels that would you know, be what you would have on one of the worst days in Los Angeles. Gas stoves put out a lot of emissions. Gas stoves leak methane gas, which is 86 times worse than CO2 in terms of their global warming impact. And they, they emit really noxious stuff. So the one thing I would tell you to take away, if nothing else from this talk, whenever you use your stove, because it's greater when you turn it on or your oven, turn on your fan. While it doesn't help global warming because it puts it out of the environment, at least it takes it out of your kitchen and you don't want to have that stuff in your kitchen. One of the people I've learned from about heat pumps is Petaluma's very own Panama Bartholomew, who uh, just moved a block away from me, I'm happy to say, and is the executive director of the Building Decarbonization Coalition, which is both a leader in California and becoming a national leader 
in promoting the decarbonization of buildings. Uh, and he has lots of data around that. We're lucky to have him here in Petaluma. The other next steps for me, besides uh, getting replacing my furnace with a heat pump, uh, be it a full heat pump or a mini split system, uh, I may be adding AC. I mean, you guys know over the last few years, uh, <laughs> we've gone from probably only needing, uh, you know, our fan at night in the bedroom to it happening week after week. And so we may be adding AC with that, um, again, because of climate change. Uh, and I also will probably be installing a home battery storage system and or getting a bi-directional EV charger. Um, there's technologies that will be coming down the pike in the next year or two. Sunrun actually already has one through a partnership with Ford for the F new Ford electric F-150, where not only can you charge your EV with your charger in your home, you can also use the battery from your electric vehicle to power your home. Uh, so that that technology will be available soon. And, you know, if as as we will be having more and more power shutoffs uh, because of the wildfire risk in California, um, we haven't had that many in Petaluma yet, but believe me, they will be coming. Um, having a battery home storage and or EV charger bi-directional is something that I'm looking forward to putting in. So I think that's my 20, 15 minutes. Uh, I know that's a lot of information in a short period of time. My last little message is from Greta Thunberg, which is, you know, sometimes people get really discouraged and they have a hard time feeling hopeful around the climate situation. And I really take um, comfort in her uh, statement that once we start to act, hope is everywhere. So we don't have to do everything, but we have to be continually doing something. And um, I'm hope hopeful that you, you know you guys are, are people who already understand this and, and will help others come to understand that. So that's my spiel. Uh, glad to answer any questions. Uh, we'll go from here. Thanks very much indeed, Rick. Uh, that was great. Um, <clears throat> we do have some questions in the um, in the chat. Um, and we can, I can either read them out or maybe if, if uh, can, I'm going to call on the people who um, uh, put the questions in there, uh, maybe it's because there's probably going to be some back and forth. Um, Eileen, you had a question um, um, regarding, did you consider other options for heating such as IR? Um, ah, somebody broke Sorry. something. Yeah, our cat. The cat. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, Eileen and Dave. Nice, nice to uh, nice that you're here. Um, <laughs> IR, so infrared. Um, what is IR? Infrared, yeah. No, um, I'm I'm uh, my sort of philosophy has been over the years, both from my solar and other business, is to focus on technologies that are um, sort of more standardized uh, because I, 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 well, other technologies may be great. I'm more interested in advancing technologies that are scalable today, both from an economic and a reliability standpoint. And so that's why I'm, I'm focused on uh, heat pump heating, yeah. I can add a little bit about IR because um, we used IR in the greenhouse uh, that I did research in. And if you, because um, that was a lot cheaper than using the very hot lamps or the straight gas heating. So you basically, you heat up these elements and the infrared heat would reflect down onto the surfaces and heat up the surfaces. So yeah, so they were used for, for greenhouse operations. They're really good. So if you have your cannabis operation, yeah, I would recommend it. But um, for home use, like for a, lot, a lot of folks use it for patios and the like, um, they heat up surfaces, not as efficient as far as I know inside homes as yet. Okay. Great, thank, thank you. We have a question from a Zoom user. Uh, any specific heat pump recommendations? Are you familiar with Harvest Thermal? Uh, yeah, I, 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 would, I, I, I wouldn't want to give any recommendations about a particular manufacturer. Um, I would say, you know, use the standard practice of getting three bids and, um, you know, seeing what they bring forward and what the, and, you know, and, and check out the, 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 the specs and, and, you know, 
talk to other people who've used it, but I, I don't, I don't recommend. I'm, I'm basically my company's model has always been to be technology agnostic. We run RFPs for these large projects. Including, by the way, we did do all the solar in the Sonoma County, uh, in the Petaluma City School District and Cinnabar District. Uh, you may have seen those shade structures. I worked with John Shribs many years ago on that project. Um, but uh, we, we don't. We, we we are looking for the the. We we find that the the contractor community is in the best position to bring forward their solutions, and then as a customer, you can figure out based on those choices what's the best for you. I'll just add a comment in there too that um, when I was doing my home electrification project, I it was actually when Panama's site was very first up, he sent it to me. I don't even know if it was public yet. The switch is on, and yes. the nice thing about using that website is it, it will direct you to certified contractors, and that's how I ended up finding my contractor. So that you know you have a contractor who's not going to try and steer you towards a gas replacement and understands the rebates and all that kind of stuff and all the, all. Yeah, yeah. Natasha is making a really important point right now, particularly around the heat pump technology. There are a lot of contractors who, you know, um, air, you know, air, air conditioning and water and whatever contractors who really haven't gotten on the heat pump bus yet. And, and so they, they are, they, I, I when I did my bid process for my water heater, I had a couple of those kind of say, well, I can do the heat pump, but, and, you know, and part of it is because in order to do a heat pump, as I, as I mentioned in my story, you may have to do some electrical work, upgrade work. And uh, there are a lot of the folks who have traditionally done gas, water and, and furnace uh, technologies who don't have that electrician capability and they would have to get a sub to do that. And they don't want to get into that, you know, that kind of business. So that we are, you know, when I say we, you know, I, I work with the Building Decarb Coalition also, and we have strategies to train contractors uh, to get them interested in moving forward. But uh, Natasha is right. You, you may get some folks who would discourage you from going down the electrification path. And, you know, if you're committed to that, you want to make sure you're, you're working with contractors who really are, are, are committed to supporting that, that's, that, that approach for you. Yeah, I want to add in just a quick uh, two comments, uh, uh, since you mentioned the heat pump water heater. Um, one comment is, if you are switching to heat pump water heater, which I did and I love it, but be forewarned that they are noisy and they do pump out cold air. Now you can vent right. that cold air like up through the attic and that kind of thing. But I actually built a little pantry room around mine. So I have like a cold storage room now but it is strapped to my living room wall and I can hear it uh, in my living room. And I did not know that I would have probably strapped it to a different wall. Yeah. Um, so be aware of that, that they, they are louder than a gas water heater. And the inter other interesting thing is like, I like how you're making a plan for the future, Rick. And I think that in the rewiring America, is that what it's called? Annie? Yeah. Um, yeah. Rewiring they have America, a whole yeah. little checklist where you go and look at your water heater, see how old it is, is when you're going to need to replace it. Because the other experience I had just a few weeks ago was at my mom's condo, her water heater broke, like actually rusted out the bottom was spilling water into her kitchen. It was actually in her kitchen. And I was desperate to not replace it with another gas water heater being me. Right. But in this day and age with supply chain issues and contractor issues, Unless I was going to make her live without water because we had to shut her whole water off because of the it's a complicated story. But unless I was going to make my mom live without water for like three and a half weeks, I had to replace it with gas. So that's the problem Which is, you're trying yeah. to get in when something breaks, right? Like, yeah, that's why you want to replace it before it breaks. <laughs> so, yeah, I should have checked the age on it a while ago. So, and, and on that cold air issue and noisy, the, the noise is the noise of the fan. Right. Yeah. And, and that fan is blowing cold air because of the way the heat pump works. It's great for me because, you know, in these extremely hot days, mm -hmm. mine's in my basement. I open the basement door. I get a nice yeah. blow of cold air coming into the house, which is a sort of a little added benefit. So, yeah. yeah, it, but I, Like I put it in a pant in a in a, you know, large storage room. So now I have cold storage. But for my mom, it was going to be in her kitchen, blowing cold yeah. air into her kitchen, noisy yeah. in her tiny little apartment. 
And anyways, and then if we put the pump, they're like, well, you could put the unit outside. They have a split unit, but then we'd have to deal with the HOA and get approval. And so anyways, needless to say, sadly, I put another gas oh my gosh. water heater in, but I, I, I use this story. I told Rihanna Frank, our um, climate action manager, this story as a I thought it was just a great experience to learn, okay, what are going to be some of the stumbling blocks in the process of electrification, especially for people, you know, who aren't in single family homes, who live with HOAs or who are in small apartments or have their water heater in a strange location or have, you know, large, you know, when it breaks, and, you have to replace it. Yeah. And, and just to kind of, the reality is, and I don't think Petaluma has gone there yet, but there's now over 70 cities around the country who basically have passed laws that say any new construction, you can't have gas appliances. I think Petaluma has that one, but the, what they're working on now, which I, which is why I, I talked to Rihanna about what they're working on now is a burnout law so that when it burns out, you have to replace it with electric, no. but then you end up with these. So we have problems. to all be very aware of what the problems might be. You know, what yeah. if you, it takes a month to get that done and you have to upgrade your electrical and you have to go through your, you know. So yeah, it gets, it's complicated. And uh, I know this may sound sacrilegious. Uh, and as was mentioned earlier, we're doing a remodel here and we're actually installing tankless gas water heaters, which are a vast improvement over the conventional mm. uh, tank units. Mm -hmm. In terms of the amount of gas used, absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. They are more efficient, uh, energy efficient. The problem is gas leaks. And the way, and the amount of gas that leaks from the wellhead where it's sourced through the pipes to storage facilities. I'm sure you've all heard of Aliso Canyon from those storage facilities through the distribution network. Um, it, 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 they, pipes leak at a much higher level than the industry has been willing to acknowledge. There's independent studies that are showing that they're leaking at three to five times greater rate than um, what the industry says. I'm not saying this to guilt trip you. I mean, I'm just wanting to have the facts out there. The, the, the issue is, um, and because again, methane, the primary component of natural gas is 86 times more warming than CO2. Uh, it, it really is a problem. We have to get off gas as quickly as possible. I'm not, yeah, again, like your situation or Natasha's mom's situation, it may be that that's not going to happen right now, but over time and as soon as possible, we really do need to get off gas or we're not going to, we're not going to solve the, we're not going to effectively solve the climate emergency that we're faced with. Yeah, I quite understand. That I did, was yeah, Sorry. I, I, I did preface it and say this would be slightly yeah. well, we're not. <laughs> However, we are we do have a gas uh, oven and range, and we are giving some serious consideration to replacing it with induction. Right. And, and not only I've will you totally help climate wise, <laughs> people who switch to induction, particularly high end chefs, they never go back. They love them. Mm. So I know. I, I, I hear it from my my son-in-law and how awful we are to have gas and so yeah yeah we're gonna do it i you know and i have a real thing with those induction stove tops I had a bad experience i was at my son-in-law's and i opened a jar of spaghetti sauce and it slipped out of my hand and it landed on his expensive brand new <laughs> induction stove top and guess what happened i can imagine oh boy yeah big break and well, we paid to replace them. He didn't insist on that. I just felt like we should. So we did. But um, I thought they were bulletproof nearly, but obviously. <laughs> not when I'm around. Not, not, not spaghetti <laughs> jar proof. <It's> the <laughs> only <laughs> bullet is not spaghetti jar. Remember that. Uh, uh, I yeah, I have to say, Rick, I, I'm glad you brought that up, that point up, because that was one of the things I that was so vivid in the very, very first time I ever met Panama Bar Bartholomew was at a. Uh, 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 business at uh, the Sonoma Clean Power or the is it, uh, Advanced Energy Center, uh, the Climate Center's business breakfast, and he gave right. his presentation and he showed the the gas leak maps. And I think it, it happened to be I think it was actually the same day there were all those explosions in Boston. Remember yeah. when all there when that all that yeah. stuff happened? It was like the same day. It was like yeah. apropos. Mm -hmm. um, but he. Uh, 
that I had no idea that the methane links and that it's and that I also did not know at that point that that the natural natural gas is actually 90 something percent methane mm -hmm. um I had no idea about that so that was like a big like turning point in my mind about like oh what is really going on here yeah it's interesting I always get uh pissed off when I see these buses with powered by natural gas it should say powered with ch4 <laughs> methane, really. it's powered by methane really powered by methane exactly okay. yeah um, rick, rick you mentioned this smart water heater or is that a kind of an option that you can get so that uh sonoma clean power controls your yeah water heater they i mean when i say control they have the option so so let's say they they have um you know the pricing in the wholesale market that they're dealing with is such that it would be helpful to them to um, do more, use more energy in the afternoon when power is cheap, right? Because we have so much solar in California now right. versus in the evening when people come home and want to cook, yeah. then they may once or twice a month, depending because these markets are dynamic markets in terms of pricing, right? Yeah. Um, so if it's better for all of us ratepayers for them to essentially store energy in the form of hot water, uh, they can do that, right? By heating up your water heater at that time. Yeah, and so it's load balancing, I guess. And is that a, a, a financial benefit to you to allow that? Five bucks a month. Okay. Yeah. I have the same I mean, it doesn't, thing, yeah. It, it doesn't affect you know, my usage, uh, right. but it's, yeah, five bucks a month. And uh, it's called the GRIDS, it's part of the GRID Savvy program. GRID Savvy, okay, okay. Yeah. okay. And, and they basically go over your router and... and uh, right. Yeah, okay, great. And they, they have that program with the EV charger, but um, <laughs> the device that they gave me doesn't work really well. So I, I, haven't, I haven't seen it used with my EV charger. That they, 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 this was one of those things where they were an early adopter of a technology that doesn't seem to work that well, but I'm sure we'll get one. The, the bi-directional charger is really the future. That's what that's, you know, yeah. the next five years. Yeah. Pretty much anybody who has an EV and has a system at home, a uh, level two at home, they'll have this bi directional charger. Are there any other, just before we, are there any other questions about uh, water heaters? I do want, I have a couple of questions about the bi directional uh, uh, battery. Um, but it, I, just... I'll just bring up Dale's comment, which is true, Dale. Uh, the heat pump water heater can be programmed to the times of day so that you can change when the noise is. And I right. did that originally. I programmed it so it wasn't on in the evening when I was sitting across the wall from it. But I think maybe because of that program that you just talked about, I think I am signed up for that. Um, so it it doesn't seem to follow that, but I haven't really investigated. I've gotten kind of used to it now, but- um, Natasha, that yeah. if you have a ream, that that's one of the big, disadvantages is the control system and the monitoring system is a piece of garbage <laughs> and and many people have problems with it not following the schedule if you yeah. lose your internet momentarily at the at the change of state point it stays yeah. in the previous state but there's a lot of other problems as well i mean that's kind of an an understandable problem but it'll just stop working the, anyway, the, sorry for uh, going the, off. No, on that no, it's true. It's but... all these things, and I and and I, I like to experiment on myself because I I don't want I don't mind having you know to figure things out, but I want other people to have good experiences so that you know the reputation that follows is good. So I, I just like to bring up any kind of. I'm glad you gave that point. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't had that problem yet, but maybe you know I. I... I don't know who your internet provider is, but yeah, I haven't had that problem. I've had it for about a year. And but once you, once you get it working right, I mean, we're a two person household that we're using less than a kilowatt a day on the water heating. We're doing it completely at the off, off peak times and we do it when the noise doesn't bother us. There you go. That's a good yeah. idea. Yeah, uh, you're, you're, you're uh, inspiring me to go back on my little app here, which I haven't looked at since we installed it really. And uh, <laughs> fix that. <laughs> Thank you. Rick, we have a couple of questions about uh, solar um, and batteries. And one of the things that I'm kind of thinking about is, is when people get solar, they get a battery. Maybe they're lucky enough to need a new, a new car, in which case they get an electric car and a bi-directional um, uh, EV car. Um, 
is the, then the need for a, a battery system uh, just nullified by having a, a bidirectional car? Well, I mean, I guess there's, there's two pieces. Um, the primary value of the battery given with the way residential rates are structured right now is that um, we are moving to you know, uh, a situation where residential rates are what are called time of use. Now, and they're not all time of use. The time of use basically means that if, if you're on such a rate structure, you, your, your rate that you pay for the electricity you use is dependent on the supply demand uh, of power over the 24 hour period. Well, the peak period, the most expensive power used to be in the afternoon, right? When everybody was turning on their air conditioning in California in the summer and other times of the year. Since solar has come on and solar produces most of its power in that afternoon period, in that supply demand equation, uh, the afternoons become the cheapest source of power, uh, times of power, and the evening, the four to nine period is becoming more expensive. But if you have solar, it's not producing a whole lot of power at four to nine. So you can charge your battery with your solar in the afternoon and discharge it during that four to nine period to reduce your overall cost. That's one reason that people are using batteries. That's more prevalent right now in the commercial side in schools and others because their rate structures are particularly focused on that, that, that demand supply, supply demand equation. It's coming for residential. Um, it's not fully here, but it, it's, it's gonna be here sooner than you might think. Um, and so having a battery to do that back and forth can be very economic. Obviously, the battery also serves as a what we call a resiliency device. It can serve as backup when the grid goes down, right? Which just having a standalone storage cannot do. Storage standalone storage by itself won't do that. Um, the issue with why would you need a home storage versus a using your car is that you know during an extended outage, um, you're probably going to want to be charging your car. <laughs> yeah. so you can move around because during extended uh, outage, there's not going to be, uh, you know, charging stations, public start charging stations, you know, very available. So yeah. having that capability gives you the mobility that you might want during those outage periods, which if you only have, have that and not have the home battery, it makes it harder. So it really comes down to your, your need and your situation and, you know, how much coverage do you want to have? Right. Um, I happen to think that within the next 10 years, having solar and a home battery and a bi-directional with a car is going to be a really smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's not, it doesn't seem obvious today, mm -hmm. but the way that things are going uh, around the need for these shutoffs, and the shutoffs are going to be happening more and more, not just because of the WAF uh, fire risk, but because of, frankly, the movement towards a more renewable grid. Renewable energy is what's called more intermittent, right? And so the job of balancing the grid, the demand and supply, because they have to be in balance or the grid gets stressed and has to be shut off. That becomes a much more complex problem when you don't have nuclear as a base load, when you don't have uh, as much gas-fired power plants as a base load. Um, we will get there where we'll be able to do that managing, but there's gonna be an intermediate period uh, I think in the next five to 10 years where the grid's going to have to be shut down to do that balancing or not just shut down, it'll be more targeted. There'll be certain parts of the grid geographically that will be shut down or uh, so that the overall grid can stay up. We don't have these rolling blackouts, right? Uh, and so in that environment, it may make sense to, you know, if you're concerned about particularly people who have medical devices that need constant power, um, it's, you know, you, you really can't take that risk. So yeah. that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of the reason why you may want to go down that full path. Okay, okay, thank you. Jim, you had a, a question about uh, free solar batteries from uh, Sonoma Clean Power? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, not, I, not, I, sorry if I, yeah, I, did, I don't mean free. There are incentives Nothing for batteries free. from the California Public Utilities Commission called the SGIP program, Self-Generation Incentive Program, okay. where you can get a portion of your battery paid for, uh, but it's not the it's not 100. percent And the the value of those incentives is going down over time. Now there is in the current proposed budget, California budget, 
um, a, a increase in the amount of money available in that program. The governor has proposed um, something in the neighborhood of 700 million to go into that program because that program is almost out of money. So if you're interested in a battery, you know, advocate for that budget to get passed. <clears throat> yes. Summer. And, um, it, <clears throat> and is it a specific battery? No, no. You do so have to have a, you, you know, in, in, in specking your battery, your batteries have to meet certain state requirements. The California Energy Commission right. has certain batteries that it's certified. Uh, but again, talk to three or four, you know, contractors, uh, suppliers, and get them, and they, they will handle, and the proposal they will give you for both the solar and the storage will, should, if it's done properly, show where those incentives fit in, as well as the investment tax credit, which is still available, right. uh, which also offsets uh, a certain portion of, of, your, of your cost of your solar and storage system. Right. Well, we, we just had solar shingles installed. We were the first ones in Northern California with uh -huh. this tim Timberline GIF uh -huh. solar shingles. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Yep. And we elected not to do the battery because the requirement would be that it's a Tesla battery and it was available at the tune of about 15 grand. Yeah. And so we Pretty chose at yeah. this point in time, it's like mm, we can add it later if we so choose. That's right. Um, but at this point in time, we're going to. Yeah, and, and, you know, I think that battery prices will go down over time, just as solar prices have gone down. I mean, when I put my first solar system in at the Santa Rosa School District in 2007, I paid six dollars and 80 cents uh, per watt. Forget about what that means. Today, you can buy panels equal to better quality for 40 cents per watt. Right. So the price of solar panels has come down significantly since then. Uh, and, you know, we haven't seen that same. We've seen a little bit of that curve in batteries, but in the past year or two, it's kind of the curve has flattened and a little, gone a little bit up because the battery manufacturers, uh, Tesla and others, are putting more of their supply into EVs. They're not making. And so I literally have projects that are you know, waiting 12, 18 months for battery systems for schools because the suppliers can't supply it. It's, you know, right. the batteries are being taken up by EVs, which overall is a good thing. And it's, setting a, you know, it's sending a demand signal to the market to ramp up production, which is a good thing. And with that ramp up production, we will see over time uh, a, re a reduction in the cost of those batteries. But as you said, it just didn't make economic sense for you right now. Yeah. No. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, if we have time, I'd love to hear Derek's story about trying. Uh, I would love it, Derek, if you'd share your story about your your range conversion. Oh yeah, yes, great, Derek. I I'm struggling with the same thing because I have a nice big wolf range, which I actually don't really like. That I mean, it doesn't work that well, but it looks really beautiful, and it's a big old <laughs> chunk of metal, and yeah. I don't want to throw it away. I don't want to put it in a landfill, and like. Like you said, if you sell it, then somebody else is just still using gas. Wait, I, I want so. it. Never mind. I won't get uh, an induction. <laughs> <laughs> well, and 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 so so Derek's trying to convert his. So tell us uh, how that's Oh, that's right. Yeah. So originally, I I thought I would just sell it or you know get rid of it, and I found I went up to uh, I forget what the place is up in Santa Rosa. And I found a lovely heritage looking like Mars Arocco or something like that. And I was like, wow, this would be perfect. And it was going to cost a pretty penny, but I'm like, Hey, in order to keep my, you know, the style of my home, I'm, I, I'm willing to give up coffee and wine for a few months. And um, then I asked them, well, what are you going to do with this? And they're like, Oh, we're just going to put it in the recycle stream. And so I was pretty bummed about that. And then I told this story to my block at the next cool block meeting. And they just, you know, they he, being taught humility from your, your, your neighbors and your, your, your block members is such a wonderful thing. And they just said, you can't do that. You can't sell it. You can't right Cause someone else is going to use it. And in essence, you're just creating more demand side, you know, demand for, for things when you don't need to. And so I started following up on electrifying it. 
And it's been really fun because it requires some changes. So the first thing is, is I'm not going to have an oven, but you can buy countertop ovens, which are pretty, which can be quite large. So I can still bake bread. I'm a big bread baker. Um, and I just move it out of the way when I don't need it. And then since my kitchen's small, that means those oven portions within the Wedgwood, they'll become storage. And then I'll, I'm working with a company down in, I think they're in Oakland called Apple Stoves. And all they do is refurbish these old gas stoves. And I called them and they're like, no, we've never done anything like that. But we were just talking about that today and we'd really like to actually try. And they got so excited that once I started finding induction inserts that I could use, they actually started going out to Ikea and all of the stores down in and around Emeryville to, to, to get the measurements for themselves to see what could, what could be done. And so it's just been a, a wholly positive and exciting experience to be like, I can still keep the character of my home. I can, you know, reduce the amount of methane and CO2. I can, you know, do all of these wonderful things um, and electrify my house at the same time and probably for less is what it's looking at right now. That's exciting. I, I am a little bummed that they haven't figured out how to change the oven. Like I thought that might actually be not that hard, but I guess it is. Well, it, it'll depend on your yeah. situation, right? So, cause I have a split yeah. where there's like a steamer thing on one side and then the oven on the other, and they're both very small openings. Got it. So there were no inserts that I could find that would fit in there unless I, you really wanted to gut the whole thing and, and, and find some things, but I, I'm fine with that. Cause I'm always struggling for space in my kitchen <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, you're going to have to share it. We'll see how the story get, unfolds. And then you'll, the, those people uh, might have a whole new business from all of us, Peloton folks calling them up. That's my hope, right? Like fun. we, we, it's part of, this is, we could create demand for them to do this type of thing and then they'll hopefully have a business all through the bay area to do these retrofits like i'm getting ahead of myself but i'm so freaking excited about that possibility <laughs> maybe, you need, maybe you need to start that business <laughs> sign up for the royalties now yeah uh just want to thank Tom. Tom's put some some great information into the uh, the chat. There's a great guide to to electric stoves and countertop stoves in that uh, in that document. He's just dropped into the chat. Ha definitely have a look at that. Um, I tried an induction stove and I opted to put together a different system. So I started with just a little single portable mm -hmm. and did that off on the side and then. Realized we liked it so much. It took a while to learn how to use it because we boiled water over the top and made a big mess on the counter. But once we got used to regulating it, how to regulate the temperature and use it, um, so I did is I took out two burners of my gas stove. So I had a lift out. I could lift out that unit, and I put in a, 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 like a wooden unit. You could also do it in plastic, but I was able to put a little wooden stand in there instead, and just and then insert into that a just the same thing. So the plug. So there is a plug that goes from there outside that you can see that goes to the wall, but it works really well and is a very, very cheap alternative to, to changing out your range top. So just getting one to get it and replacing a couple burners and I, my fan is inside my, my range. So I don't have to do a big conversion, which would take thousands and thousands of dollars because the, the fan would have to be replaced and, and change that all out. So just adding a unit on the side and replacing the two burners, it's a 100 to $200 cost and um, and that actually, it's all we need we, uh, with the two of us, even three of us, we only need one or two burners at, at any one time now because we're using the microwave, we have an air fryer. Um, so we, we have all this other stuff. We don't really use it that much. We didn't yeah, know we, we did the same thing. We, we put in, a, we, put in we, we bought one of these air fryer mini ovens and we hardly ever use our, our I mean, we have, you know, just, just the two of us, but Except when we have you know guests over, I don't think we've used the oven in, since we bought that thing because the, the electric air fryer oven toaster thingamajig takes care of everything and it really doesn't take up that much counter space. All right, we'll all be over in about twenty minutes. <laughs> what are you cooking? <laughs> um, can I ask Dale? Dale, you put something interesting into the the chat. 
about using your hybrid to uh, to power your all your lights. Uh, did you get is that kind of a, a, a an inverter? What did you do there to do that? Yeah, I have a a, a f- I can't remember if it was fifteen hundred or two thousand watt uh, inverter. That's that's average, and then the peak goes twice that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know you don't want to use it because that, that would draw down your battery really fast. I, I wanted it big enough. That, you know, a refrigerator has a big peak right at the beginning. Right. So I started with a 500 watt inverter and uh, it, it wasn't big enough for the refrigerator. And, and I kind of want my cold beer on those on those extended days of, uh, of no power. So, um, yeah, so I have a Honda Clarity. Um, it has a 17 kilowatt hour um, battery um, and I have a 1500 or 2000 uh, watt uh, inverter. And, you know, it's kind of funky. I have extension cords running through the house, uh, you know, to power computers, LED lights, you right. know, uh, the modem, um, <clears throat> that's a telephone system. Um, and and the biggest load is the refrigerator. I wouldn't try to, you know, run my furnace. Um, and then the stove, we have all electric stove and all and a dryer. And we wouldn't definitely wouldn't do that off the car either. Uh, so like Tom, I, I, uh, for, for a stove, um, I, I got a, uh, a camper stove. Um, and you know, what's interesting is I got this all set up and I guess because we live close to Kaiser or something, we've never had an extended power <laughs> outage, knock on wood, um, but we're ready. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, uh, Dale, so you plug that inverter into, you hook it onto your 12 volt battery and then you keep yes. power on. Yeah, okay, yes. uh, yeah, good, I've done the same, good. Um, yeah, and, and of course, uh, yeah, somebody wanted more details and, you know, I, I, uh, this is not according to a Honda warranty uh, yeah, I was uh, requirements say. And, <laughs> and stuff. So, you know, it's just a matter of time and they're going to offer this as standard options. I right. mean, there's no technical reason right. not to do it. It's just that there's not, maybe not a big enough market, but two-way power with your car is just such a winner. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to say no, it's, it's, it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, we're we're heading towards seven o'clock. Do we have any any last questions? Um, Bernie, I'll just throw in my one other fun experiment I just did recently, um, which you see these around sometimes. But uh, for my wood burning fireplace, I used to put candles in it, but the candles actually put out a lot of smoke too. Like I noticed my air quality going down. So I got this really fun electric fake log set that like sh- shoots up like pictures of flames up the back of the fireplace and has like a crackling sound. And it, it's weirdly kitschy and fun and, you know, just kind of playful. So, you know, there you can get playful with your electrification too. And you can get an induction stove that has little blue flame lights it makes it look like you have a flame. If you really need that, you know, that flame experience, you can get an induction top that does yes. that also. Well, one of our team members is on here, Tom. He he and his wife just put in an electric uh, fireplace recently. It's really nice and it has a remote and it has sound and it's a, it's a really cool unit. Huh, Tom? <laughs> He's muted. Anyway, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. So... So, John, can I just comment on Tom Cabot's uh, point about a $130 inverter? Yep. Um, that's going to work for some loads, but uh, but you got to be really, I mean, you know, you might want to uh, spend a little bit more money for a, a nicer inverter. And, and somebody that's an electrical engineer can explain this better than I am. Uh, but um, I, I think it's called a synchronous inverter. Or, or pure uh, sine wave. Pure, pure sine wave. Pure sine wave is what you need. And, and you, I don't I think you get um, 1,500 watt pure Not sine like wave inverters wave. for 130 bucks. But, but again, it just depends on what your load is. Whether whether the, the the 500 watt one I have is is not a pure sine wave, and I I can use it too. It plugs into the cigarette lighter. Yeah, some of your devices uh, do need a pure sine wave. Um, some of them don't, um, but just, you know, it, it's probably better. You spend a little bit extra, you get a pure sine wave uh, inverter and you're better off, a little bit more expensive, but then you're, then you're good. Well, wonderful. Well, we'll bring it to a close. Rick, uh, thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, really appreciate. Uh, yes, thank you, Rick. And thank you for, to everyone for all the comments too. Yeah, yeah great, great discussion. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. We will get there. They heard my dog barking in the background. That's her after after dinner uh, <laughs> walk that needs to happen. So I got to expend some energy. Uh, right. So I'm going to have to head out. But nice to meet you all. Thanks very much indeed, Rick. Really appreciate hey. it.